Okay, in our video series of gastroenterology lectures, in this video, we are going to talk about ulcerative colitis. We are going to discuss the presentation, the clinical signs and symptoms, the diagnosis and the treatment of ulcerative colitis in detail. First of all, a 20-year-old young man comes to your clinic, complains that, Doctor, I have this abdominal pain. And whenever I get this abdominal pain, I have to go and attend the washroom. And whenever I go to washroom, I pass blood. There are no stools. It's all blood. There, is, there are bloody stools ab associated with abdominal pain and cramps. And doctor, even when I pass the stools, I still have these abdominal pains and cramps. This is a classical presentation of a patient with inflammatory bowel disease. Now, what is inflammatory bowel disease? Inflammatory bowel disease is a condition in which there is inflammation of the intestines. Among the inflammatory bowel disease, we have two conditions, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Now, these are the main two important ones that you must know. Ulcerative colitis is an inflammatory bowel disease characterized by chronic mucosal inflammation of the rectum, colon and the cecum. Remember, ulcerative colitis is an inflammatory bowel disease and it affects the large intestine. It affects the colon. It affects the intestines from the cecum. To the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, the sigmoid colon and the rectum. Remember, it always involves the rectum. It involves the large intestine and it spares the small intestine. It involves the large intestine and it always involves the rectum. This is very important. The involvement of rectum is the classical hallmark of ulcerative colitis. And remember, the ulcers that it causes the lesions that it causes and the areas that it affect, ulcerative colitis affects the intestines continuously. The areas that are affected have continuous lesion. There is no sparing of any area in the large intestine that is not affected by the disease. Unlike in Crohn's disease, in Crohn's disease we will study that patients will have sparing of some areas of intestine and then there will be lesions. But in ulcerative colitis there are continuous lesions. Prevalence, it is higher in white population. Ulcerative colitis has a peak incidence in 15 to 35 years of age. And it rarely occurs in children less than 10 years of age. It affects males and females equally. Another peak is also seen in patients after 50 years of age that can be affected with ulcerative colitis. The risk factors of ulcerative colitis include genetic predisposition. Remember, ulcerative colitis is associated with HLA-B27. There is an association of HLA-B27 with ulcerative colitis. And remember, if you remember the video on ankylosing spondylitis, the reactive arthropathies, conditions like psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, in those patients, there is HLA-B27 positive. Those patients have HLA-B27. Therefore, the patients of ulcerative colitis usually have a strong association with skeletal problems like arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis because there is a genetic predisposition of HLA-B27 in these patients. Ethnicity, Ashkenazi, Jewish descents are most commonly affected. In 20% of the patients, you will find a family history of ulcerative colitis and GI problems. The increased fat intake, in, the fat oxidizes and it, and it damages the intestine. Oral contraceptive drugs have been seen to be associated to cause ulcerative colitis. NSAIDs may exacerbate ulcerative colitis. So, in these patients with ulcerative colitis, NSAIDs are usually avoided. The protective factors of ulcerative colitis include appendectomy and smoking. Remember, in past, appendectomy was used as a treatment of ulcerative colitis. In patients with ulcerative colitis, they used to perform appendectomy. They removed the appendix and that used to resolve the ulcerative colitis. Smoking, it is the only condition. It is the only condition where you will find and you will be amazed at why is smoking is in the protective factors of ulcerative colitis. It is the only condition where smoking helps but remember the risks of smoking the risk of smoking are so much that you can never ask the patient to start smoking because uh, smoking causes so many cancers but the studies have shown that it has a protective effect in ulcerative colitis ulcerative colitis is classified based on the areas of the large intestine it involves 
Montreal classification for the extent of ulcerative colitis classifies it into E1, which is ulcerative proctitis, and the condition is only limited to rectum. Like this is the large intestine, and if the disease only involves the rectum, and it remember ulcerative colitis almost always involves the rectum. It almost always involves the rectum and causes bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain in these patients, and that is called as E1 disease. Coming to E2, E2 is left-sided ulcerative colitis and it is limited to colon distal to the splenic flexure. This is the splenic flexure where the spleen lies and ahead of the splenic flexure, distal to the splenic flexure, whole of this intestine is involved that is called as E2. In the E3, there is extensive ulcerative colitis and it extends proximal to the splenic flexure. Proximal to the splenic flexure, this is where the spleen lies and proximal to the splenic flexure, whole of the intestine is involved, that is called as E3. So, this is the Montreal classification. Now, remember there are many classification systems for ulcerative colitis based on the endoscopic features, based on the clinical features. I have just stated one important one over here. American College of Gastroenterology has made this classification criteria based on the clinical features as well as the endoscopic feature seen in ulcerative colitis. Now, it divides the condition into mild, moderate to severe and fulminant ulcerative colitis and it is based on the number of stools the patient passes, the blood in stools, the urgency the patient feels to pass the stools, hemoglobin level, ESR level, CRP level, very important, fecal calprotectin levels. The on the basis of endoscopic features that are present. Now, these last two are basically the ulcerative colitis endoscopic findings. So, these are another separate uh, scoring criteria like myo scoring criteria. They are also included in the uh, ulcerative colitis index so that you can find out the severity of ulcerative colitis in the patient. Now, you don't need to remember all of it. In, for the practical purposes, in the, uh, you can always review these guidelines and classify the patient. But for exams, you do not need to memorize these classification criteria. Now, remember in the pathophysiology of ulcerative colitis, there is involvement of the immune system and there is dysregulation and disruption of the intestinal epithelium. Now, normally in the gut, there are millions of bacteria that are present in the gut. Now, those gut bacteria are not exposed to the blood because if they are exposed to the blood, there will be an immune attack on those bacteria and that will damage the gut wall. What happens in ulcerative colitis, this is a, a, a hypothesized mechanism where there is disruption of the intestinal epithelium and that disruption of the intestinal epithelium leads to exposure of the gut bacteria to the immune system and immune system then attacks these bacteria and in turn damages the gut, it damages the colon resulting in inflammation of the gut. There is dysregulation of the intestinal epithelium, increased permeability of the luminal bacteria to the blood where the immune system attacks and immune mediated attack on GIT takes place. And the attack of the immune system on GIT results in inflammation of the gut and there is bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain in these patients. Now remember, rectum is almost always involved in ulcerative colitis and there is an ascending pack pattern that ascends from the rectum to the cecum and it involves the gut continuously. Now coming to the clinical signs and symptoms of ulcerative colitis. In the clinical signs and symptoms, remember the classical symptoms with which the patient would come to you would be bloody diarrhea with mucus, the fecal urgency. Remember the patient would tell you that doctor, I have this abdominal pain. And whenever I get these abdominal pains, I go to washroom and I pass stools. And in the stools, all I pass is just blood. There is blood in stools and mucus in stools and there is abdominal pain. With the abdominal pain, there are these abdominal cramps and tenesmus. What is tenesmus? Tenesmus is a sense of incomplete evacuation. When they go to washroom, even though the rectum is empty, still they get this sensation that they, they still need to pass the stools and they have these abdominal cramps that is called as tenesmus, the in sensation of incomplete evacuation despite an empty rectum. So, these are the classical symptoms with which these patients would come to you. Now, coming to extra intestinal symptoms, remember ulcerative colitis involves the colon, it involves the gut. 
but with the involvement of gut there is involvement of other systems of the body as well and the most common system that is involved if they ask you in exams it's the skeletal system that is in most commonly involved in ulcerative colitis ankylosing spondylitis osteoarthritis sacroiliitis that is the most common manifestation in these patients skeletal manifestation is the most common extra intestinal symptom in these patients other than that patient would complain of fatigue fever because they are having this chronic abdominal pain and diarrhea all the time they may be having uveitis scleritis remember you know in a i have a full video on on ankylosing spondylitis and i have talked about hla b27 and how is it associated with these arthritis and arthropathies and remember in ankylosing spondylitis we discussed that with ankylosing spondylitis usually the patient has uveitis and scleritis so ankylosing spondylitis has a strong association with inflammatory bowel diseases like ulcerative colitis primary sclerosing cholangitis remember a very high yield point for exams in exams they would give you a scenario that there is a young boy and that young boy is having bloody diarrhea and with that bloody diarrhea they would give you a history of jaundice in that patient and they would expect you to know that primary sclerosing cholangitis a condition in which there is damage of the biliary duct extra biliary duct are damaged in a condition an autoimmune condition called as primary sclerosing cholangitis and 90% of the patients of primary sclerosing cholangitis have ulcerative colitis associated with it so you must remember that ulcerative colitis is associated with primary sclerosing cholangitis erythema nodosum the painful lesions on the anterior shins aphthous stomatitis aphthous stomatitis are aphthous ulcers in the mouth the painful ulcers that we have in the mouth now remember aphthous ulcer is also seen in crohn's disease and in exams if they give you aphthous ulcer and give you bloody diarrhea it is very likely that they want you to click on crohn's disease so if you have these aphthous ulcers and uh, and you are confused between choosing ulcerative colitis and crohn's disease go for crohn's disease as it involves uh, the whole of the git from mouth till the anus now coming to an important point it is rare for the patients of ulcerative colitis to develop primary sclerosing cholangitis but up to 90% of the patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis will have ulcerative colitis associated with it now remember if a patient has primary sclerosing cholangitis 90% of the cases have ulcerative colitis associated with it but if the patient is having ulcerative colitis it is rare for them to develop primary sclerosing cholangitis I have a simple mnemonic from you from which you can remember the all manifestations of ulcerative colitis that is the ulcers because there are many ulcers that occur in ulcerative colitis u for ulcers l for large intestine as it involves the large intestine from cecum to the rectum t for colon cancer remember ulcerative colitis and crohn's disease both increase the risk of colon cancer previously in books it was written that it's just the ulcerative colitis that increases the risk of colon cancer now crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis have equal risk of colon cancer c for continuous because it causes continuous involvement of the intestine from rectum to the cecum c for crypt abscesses crypt abscesses are basically abscesses that are found in the crypts of liver cune in the intestine now we will study in the diagnosis that when you take a biopsy in these ulcerative colitis patient and you look it under the microscope what you would see is that there is pus accumulation in the normal crypt of the intestinal epithelium and that is called as a crypt abscess is very important point in ulcerative colitis patients e it extends proximally from rectum to the uh, cecum so it extends proximally it is as, as it is an ascending pattern r for red diarrhea s for sclerosing cholangitis now coming to disease course now what is disease course how would the disease progress ahead the most common disease course in these patients is chronic intermittent now ulcerative colitis is a chronic disease now these chronic intermittent uh, disease course patients have a chronic disease and that they are doing well and all of a sudden they get this exacerbation and during this exacerbation they have this bloody diarrhea bloody stools abdominal pain they get the treatment and they are do they are doing well after that so they are totally fine in between the exacerbations they are totally okay exacerbation followed by complete remission that is the chronic intermittent intermittently they get the exacerbations otherwise they are doing fine some patients will have chronic continuous disease course in the chronic continuous disease course these patients 
हैव अ क्रॉनिक डिजीज एंड दे हैव क्रॉनिक सिम्टम्स ऑल द टाइम दे हैव डायरिया दे हैव दिज एबडोमिनल पेन मे बी नॉट टू अ वेरी हाई फ्रिक्वेंसी एज इट एज इट अकर्स इन एग्जरबेशन बट दे दे हैव दिस क्रॉनिक डिजीज ऑल द टाइम एंड दे गेट दिज एग्जरबेशन वेर दे इज वर्सनिंग ऑफ दिस डिजीज बट दैट एग्जरबेशन डज नॉट कम्प्लीटली रिजॉल्व दैट एग्जरबेशन डज नॉट कम्प्लीटली रिमिट सो देर इज नो कम्प्लीट रिमिशन द कम्प्लीट रिमिशन डज नॉट अकर इन क्रॉनिक कॉन्टिन्यूस सो दे हैव अ कॉन्टिन्यूस क्रॉनिक डिजीज in acute fulminant condition it is sudden onset and it is very severe and it is deadly in which they get this severe full blown diarrhea with severe dehydration anemia shock due to loss of blood and sudden onset and it is an emergency and you have to admit these patients and treat these patients we will discuss the treatment of all of these in detail a sub type a variant of ulcerative colitis that i would like to discuss is that as i said that rectum is almost always involved and it is it uh, the disease ascends upward to the cecum and it does not go ahead to small intestine it is a disease of the colon but in some patients there can be inflammation of the terminal ileum and remember in crohn's disease it's the ileum that is involved in crohn's disease it's the ileum that is involved in ulcerative colitis it's the rectum that is involved so sometimes in some cases remember in the clinical practice there can be backwash ileitis that inflammation would go to the ileum and that would cause inflammation of the terminal ileum now in these patients it is bit difficult to diagnose ulcerative colitis because the ileum is also involved so in it is a variant is a sub type where there is overlap of ulcerative colitis and crohn's disease now in real life it is very difficult to differentiate ulcerative colitis and crohn's disease just based on the symptoms because there is a huge overlap of the symptoms and the clinical features in real life but for exam purposes remember ulcerative colitis has continuous involvement ulcerative colitis involves the rectum ulcerative colitis is limited to the colon on the other hand crohn's disease involves the whole of git from mouth till the anus Crohn's disease has skip lesions where some areas of the GIT are affected the some of GIT areas are not affected Crohn's disease does not involve the rectum it spares the rectum but it hits the terminal ileum and terminal ileum is the main part that is involved in Crohn's disease so these are some important differences that you should know for the inflammatory bowel diseases it makes it difficult to differentiate ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease if the patient is having backwash ileitis Now coming to the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis remember i have also made a video on the chronic diarrhea workup in the chronic diarrhea workup i have explained in detail that how a patient would chronic diarrhea would come to you and how would you do the whole workup now if a patient comes to you with hematochesia and fecal urgency hematochesia means blood in stools with fecal urgency you have to see whether these symptoms are for less than 1 month or greater than 1 month if they are for less than 1 month it's very likely and it's very common that patient might have developed a dysentery shigella dysentery where the patient is having blood in the stool and abdominal pain so you have to do the stool testing and a trial of antibiotics can be given in these patients but if the patient is having symptoms greater than 1 month it is chronic and most likely if it was dysentery it would have been resolved by itself but if it is it has not resolved it's likely that that patient is having bloody stools with urgency likely secondary to an inflammatory bowel disease the next thing you have to do is and the main thing you have to do in these patients is to perform ileocolonoscopy you pass a scope through the anus and that scope goes inside the colon and it also has a look in the ileum as well that is called as ileocolonoscopy if you cannot perform ileocolonoscopy or if the patient refuses the procedure or if there is any contraindication what you can use is that you can perform ct or mri of the abdomen to look for the inflammation of the intestines but remember it is it is more important that you perform ileocolonoscopy in these patients because ileocolonoscopy is the main investigation to diagnose ulcerative colitis ileocolonoscopy severe disease is a relative contraindication to the scope if a patient is having severe disease severe inflammation and if the patient comes to you with fulminant ulcerative colitis in these patients if you pass the scope there is a risk that you might perforate the intestines because the intestines are weak and inflamed and if you pass the scope at that time there is a chance that you will pass the scope through the intestinal wall and there will be perforation 
So in such cases, what you can do is for the diagnosis, you can wait for some time. And once the patient is stable and inflammation has subsided, then you can perform the ileocolonoscopy. But ileocolonoscopy is the main investigation. Take caution while taking the biopsy because there is inflammation going on and it can result in perforation. In the early stages, what you would see is that there is inflamed erythematous edematous mucosa because there is inflammation, immune attack on the uh, mucosa and the mucosa is inflamed. The mucosa is friable and when you, with the touch of the scope, it might even start bleeding and you would see ulcers in the ulcerative colitis. This is a normal a colon, the picture of a normal colon and if this is a picture showing ulcerative colitis, look how inflamed and red and the friable mucosa just ready for bleeding. If you look at this picture and this picture, you can see the blood coming out of these ulcers and these are the ulcers that are present in patients with ulcerative colitis. So, this is how ulcerative colitis affects the colon. In the chronic disease, remember, ulcerative colitis affects the mucosa and submucosa. Very high yield, very important. There is loss of mucosal folds. The mucosal folds are lost due to damage of the mucosa. And in the later stages, what you would see is that these hostrations in the colon, we have these constrictions, the hostrations, and these constrictions, these hostrations give this structure to the colon. And these hostrations are lost in the later stages of ulcerative colitis. There will be deep ulcerations and pseudopolyp formation whenever there is inflammation and damage to the mucosa. The mucosa tries to regenerate in cells and when the mucosa tries to regenerate itself, it produces polyps. And those polyps are smooth round structures of, uh, composed of connective tissue due to regenerative attempts of the intestines. Perform esophagogastrodudinoscopy. Now, in the patients with ulcerative colitis, what we did was we passed the scope from the anal canal and we looked at the whole of the colon and we also had a peak to the ileum. But if, if you find inflammation of the ileum, then a good thing is that you also perform the upper GI scope where you do esophagogastrodudinoscopy and you go from the mouth and you look at the esophagus, you look at the stomach, you look at the duodenum and you take biopsy in such cases. So, esophagogastrodudinoscopy should be performed if you find inflammation of the ileum in ileocolonoscopy to rule out Crohn's disease. Now, when you have performed the ileocolonoscopy, during the ileocolonoscopy, you would take biopsies from the areas where there are, there are ulcers and where there are these inflammation. And then you send these, uh, pack these uh, biopsies and send them to the pathology lab. What pathology lab would do is take out these biopsies, put it under the slide and they would look it in a microscope. What they would find in the microscope is that there will be crypt abscesses. If you find crypt abscesses and bloody stools, that is a classical hallmark of ulcerative colitis. What is crypt? Basically, the intestinal epithelium has these crypts of lubricum that increase the absorptive area in intestines. Now, in these crypts, when there is ulcerative colitis, there is pus accumulation, accumulation of the immune-mediated cells, neutrophil infiltration in the crypts that results in the crypt abscesses. There is mucosal atrophy, altered crypt structures and lymphocyte infiltration. This is a picture showing a normal colon and normal crypts and this is a patient having ulcerative colitis and you look at the neutrophil and infiltrate seen in the crypt. That is a crypt abscess. That is a classical hallmark of ulcerative colitis. They might even give you a histology picture showing the crypts. These are the crypts. Now, this is a cut section like this. Now, this is a cut section and if you see, these are the, uh, are the lymphocytes and neutrophils present in the crypt. Crypt should be empty, but this is having neutrophils and immune cells. Now, this is a very high yield picture exam wise because in exams, you might receive pictures of histology and they would expect you to know that what is the presentation in ulcerative colitis and what is the presentation in Crohn's disease. In ulcerative colitis, it's simple that there are these crypts and these crypts should be empty, but there is uh, infiltrates in these. In Crohn's disease, on the other hand, in Crohn's disease, you would find granulomas. In Crohn's disease, there are granulomas, the histological picture of the Crohn's disease is granulomas. Very important. Non cassiating granulomas are seen in Crohn's disease and in ulcerative colitis, there are these crypt abscesses. Must remember this point. This is another picture showing the crypt abscess. This is the crypt and look at the infiltrates. These are the infiltrates. These are the infiltrates present in the crypt. So, you would find crypt abscesses on the biopsy.
Other than that, an important point to remember is that between the ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis only involves the mucosa and submucosa. In the intestinal epithelium, it involves the mucosa and submucosa layer. It does not involve whole of the layers of intestines. But on the other hand, Crohn's disease has transmural involvement. Crohn's disease involves whole of the intestinal wall and it forms non-cascating granulomas. Now, if you see this picture, this is the picture of an intestine and this is the mucosa, this is submucosa, this is muscularis, this is serosa. Ulcerative colitis would involve mucosa and it would also involve submucosa, but it would not go deeper than the submucosa. But Crohn's disease, on the other hand, uh, involves the whole wall of the intestine and it has transmural involvement, it involves all layers and it, therefore it results in fistulas, perforations and strictures in Crohn's disease. Now remember ileocolonoscopy is the main investigation in these patients but abdominal x-rays can also be performed. In abdominal x-ray what you would see in ulcerative colitis in the severe form, you would see lead pipe appearance. Lead pipe appearance occurs because the normal hostrations, the normal uh, hostrations that are present in the large intestine, they are lost and the whole of the intestine is just like a pipe. It is just like a lead pipe and that is called as a lead pipe appearance due to loss of colonic hostrations. Now, if you see these are the normal colonic hostrations and you can easily appreciate those constrictions that are present in the colonic wall and look over here, the, the hostrations are lost and this is a lead pipe appearance that is seen in patients with ulcerative colitis on abdominal x-ray. Other than that, toxic megacolon is a complication of ulcerative colitis. What happens in toxic megacolon is that uh, the, the uh, normal motility, the normal motility of the large intestine is lost because of the inflammation, the normal motility is lost and gut goes into a stasis. When the gut goes into a stasis, there is accumulation of feces in the gut and those that feces rots inside and produces gases and there is a excessive uh, increase in the size of the colon greater than 6 cm life-threatening complication of colitis with acute dilation of colon because of the loss of the motility. Toxic megacolon, this is the picture showing toxic megacolon. Now see, these are the colonic hostrations that are present and these colonic hostrations have been lost. That is the lead pipe appearance. But this is a picture showing toxic megacolon, a very big complication of uh, uh, ulcerative colitis. Other tests that you would perform in these patients would be CBC to look for anemias. You would perform liver function tests and if liver function tests so elevated ALP and GGT, it means that that patient is also having primary sclerosing cholangitis, maybe not symptomatic right now, but that must be looked out because that patient might be having a primary sclerosing cholangitis because it is strongly associated with it. P -anca, P anca antibodies are present in 70% of the cases, must remember P anca. P anca is actually the antibodies that is that damages the intestinal epithelium after the exposure of the gut bacteria to the bloodstream. P anca very important, elevated in 70% of the patients. Hypoalbuminemia, these patients lose uh, proteins due to excessive diarrhea and excessive inflammation of the gut. That is also a protein losing enteropathy. Ulcerative colitis patients would come to you with edema of the face, edema of the hand and feet and that would be a pitting edema and you perform the albumin level and the albumin levels are low. Hypoalbuminemia shows poor prognosis, shows severe disease. Hypoalbuminemia and elevated CRP suggests a poor prognosis in patients with ulcerative colitis. Fecal calprotectin level. Now, fecal calprotectin level is usually asked in the exams and they would ask you a question that if a patient is having uh, irritable bowel syndrome and if the patient is having inflammatory bowel disease, what is the single blood test that you would perform in these patients to differentiate the irritable bowel syndrome from inflammatory bowel disease? Remember, it's the fecal calprotectin level that is elevated in the inflammatory bowel disease and it is normal in, in uh, irritable bowel syndrome. So, irritable bowel syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion usually and if fecal calprotectin levels are elevated, you should look for inflammatory bowel disease in the patients. Now, in the next video, we'll be talking about the treatment of ulcerative colitis in detail. We'll discuss that how do you treat the acute fulminant, acute severe ulcerative colitis, how do you admit a patient and how do you treat that patient. And we'll also discuss that if a patient is having chronic ulcerative colitis, how do you treat that patient, the mild, moderate and the severe condition patients with ulcerative colitis. So make sure to watch my next video on the treatment of ulcerative colitis. Before going to the summary, please click on the subscribe button so that you do not miss out any important video from this channel.
in summary we talked about what is the inflammatory bowel disease what is the prevalence more common in 15 to 35 years of age risk factors hla b27 association and appendectomy is a protective factor smoking is a protective factor the montreal classification the american college of gastroenterology the disease activity index the immune mediated increased permeability of luminal bacteria which mediates the attack on the gut and rectum is almost always involved important that uh, patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis develop ulcerative colitis intestinal symptoms the classical symptoms and the extra skeletal manifestations being the most common ones the mnemonic to remember the disease manifestation of ulcerative colitis the disease course uh, backwash elitis makes it difficult to differentiate ulcerative colitis from crohn's disease patient having hematochesia fecal urgency greater than one month performs scopes a contraindicated scope for ctr mri if a patient is having severe disease uh, it is a relative contraindication to scope the patient and on the, on the early stages you would see the inflammation red friable mucosa later on there will be ulcers and loss of the mucosal uh, folds in the chronic disease there will be loss of hostration perform esophagogastroduodenoscopy if the patient has ileal involvement crypt abscess is main hallmark ulcerative colitis involve mucosa submucosa crohn's involve all layers crypt abscesses uh, abdominal x-ray shows lead pipe appearance toxic megacolon being a very important complication the lab tests hypoalbuminemia elevated crp show poor prognosis if you liked my video please click on the subscribe button and make sure to check out my other videos on gastroenterology lectures emergency medicine lectures ecg lectures neurology lectures the link of those playlists is given in the description below thank you very much